Happy Sabbath, happy Sabbath, happy Sabbath. Looks like all systems are go. Thank you for joining us. I'd like to uh, say thank you for the, the opportunity to come into your living room or dining room or wherever we are. Uh, and hopefully you will have invited someone to your home to enjoy this Bible class with you. But before we begin formally, I'm going to give you about two minutes to go ahead and click that share button. And if you are using Facebook, please use the watch party feature and then give uh, to, to tonight's Bible class the same title that we have given it. Therefore, people will see what they're going to watch when it comes up in the notification. You want people to know exactly what they're getting into. So it's a privilege for us to come together, and I'm thankful uh, for this opportunity. But again, before we get into it, click the share button, click the watch party feature, use WhatsApp, but use it responsibly. Don't spam anyone. I know that when there's good news about God's word, you want to just tell everybody. And we should tell everybody, but we shouldn't load up people's inboxes unless they are accustomed to us doing so or they're welcoming to it because otherwise it's spam. And we don't want to associate God's word with spam. Now, do we? And the answer should be no. Yes, so let's go ahead and use responsibly all of our sharing opportunities and social media outlets and let people know that God is good and he's always been good. And in just about a minute and a half, we're going to go ahead and begin. Uh, please go ahead and type into the feed, whether you're on YouTube or on Facebook or if somehow somebody's embedded this program into their website and they have a uh, chatting feature or, or commenting feature, please just go ahead and type how good God has been to you. I know a number of you, pardon me, have been through uh, a bunch of trials as I am going through trials too. Some of you have been healed from diseases. Some of you are going through difficulties related to sickness. And some of you, and I can think of one or two, I don't want to put you on uh, display here, but I know that God has been working through uh, through surgeons to, to help you get better as well. So I'm thankful to God for you. And in 30 seconds, we're going to go ahead and begin. But type in the feed how good God has been to you. And uh, I'm blessed that when I go around to different places and churches, whether if I'm going to the supermarket or I'm just on the road or if I go to various churches, there are persons who stop me almost 100% of the time to say that they have been uh, in experiencing the Bible class and uh, the daily the, uh, the daily morning classes relating to the Sabbath school lesson, and uh, we are all encouraged as a result. Okay, so in two just a couple seconds, we're going to go ahead and begin with prayer, and then we'll formally introduce the program. Click share, click the watch party feature, say how good God has been. Okay, we're going to go ahead and begin. Father in heaven, thank you for giving us a new Sabbath, for the privilege of of making it making it through another week. You've given us the time for preparation earlier, and now we are in the throes of the Sabbath hours. These hours are sacred. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the privilege to worship you every day, but for the time that is happening only one time every week on Saturday. Uh, from evening until evening, you said that we can celebrate, we should celebrate the Sabbath. And so thank you for this place of rest. Uh, near to your heart. Now, I'm asking you to please show us how to be victorious in Jesus Christ through your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And amen again. Well, I'd like to welcome you to the Net 2018 and Beyond. And of course, now the feature is Beyond uh, Bible Class, where we come every single Friday night, barring none. Uh, sometimes we adjust the timing in case conference is having something important that that is being streamed. Uh, but other than that, we are here every single Friday night, and it's a privilege, and we are uh, sharing in part number six of our current series. I'll get into that in a moment, but first I'd like to welcome everyone joining us on Facebook Live, everyone joining us on YouTube Live, and for those of our beloved brothers and sisters who are joining us, getting a little tongue-tied here, on NCU TV, I'd like to say hello and happy Sabbath. Thank you for joining us. And uh, so what we're going to do this evening is uh, survey part number six in our lesson study series, The Victorious Life. And I have the caption here 
for part number six, Victory Through an Indwelling, and I should say the Indwelling Christ. Victory Through the Indwelling Christ. Bible says that we have hope in us, right? Christ in us, the hope of glory. And we're looking forward to the day that we can be glorified even as Jesus is now glorified with his Father. But I don't want to get ahead of myself. Thank you. And I'm asking you to please just continue to pray. Com- continue to pray for the ministry. Continue to pray for your brothers and sisters who are watching. Continue to pray for those who who are becoming your brothers and sisters, making decisions to serve the Lord. And I'm just so thankful that we have the opportunity to grow together. My name is L. David Harris. I am your host, and uh, we're going to ride together. And uh, so what I'd like to do is share, like I often do, share with you the sub subheadings that I'll be using uh, to shuttle us through this particular study, Okay. Not so many as usual. Tonight, Christ within, divinity revealed in humanity. This is not going to be a full-on Bible study about the divinity of Christ or anything like that, although I would love to do so. I'll probably be uh, looking at that on some level tomorrow at church, at Hero Circle, Lord Sparing Life. Uh, By faith through operation of the Spirit. Okay, so we're going to keep it simple and assurance of victory. All right, we'll come back to those at the appropriate time. But we're going to go ahead and begin by reading from and I and I feel I feel like I don't want to say this because I say it all the time when it comes on to the Bible. One of my favorite scriptures. Yeah, I think uh, if you do this with me long enough, you'll find that there's a favorite scripture every single week. I don't know how many favorites you can have, but. Uh, Be that as it may, one of my favorite scriptures is from the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 2, and we're going to read in verse 20. That's the book of Galatians chapter 2, and we are going to read verse 20, and hopefully you are uh, uh, bringing your Bibles to Bible class. Uh, I deliberately do not put those scriptures on the screen because I want you to give attention here, and also take up your own Bibles. Flip those pages, and if you're into devices, go ahead and use your device for good. Turn off the notifications so you won't be distracted by them, and go ahead and get to the Bible text in your device. And the Bible reads, and this is Paul speaking, very interesting uh, and very, very, very pregnant verse of Scripture I am crucified with Christ. Hmm. So that's one phase of his experience with God. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And so, of course, this is the other phase of his experience. They go together, though. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. Faith, what kind of faith? Faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, let me ask you a question. Was Paul alive when Jesus was being crucified? No, let me say it like this. Maybe that's not the best way to say it. Was Paul on the cross with Christ when Christ was crucified? And while you're thinking about it, apply it to yourself. Were you alive when Christ was crucified? Well, of course not. That was thousands of years ago. Uh, Were you on the cross when Christ was being crucified? And so we need to to, to sort of uh, deal with those questions because this has to do with a spiritual life experience. That's what this has to do with. So I am crucified with Christ. Let me ask you a question. What is the penalty for sin? For sin. Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Put that one side, death. Put death right here. If you're writing on a chalkboard or, oh, I'm showing my age. If you're writing on a dry erase board or you're typing on a, or writing on a whiteboard, smart board, can you imagine how technology has changed everything? Put that one side, right? So the wages of sin is death. But... 
that is a coordinating conjunction, but the gift of God, put that this side now, is what? Eternal life. So with that but in between, right, comma, but, the gift of God is eternal life. That shows that there's a contrast, right? So if you say, I love to drink water, but it hurts my belly. Well, now it sounds like the hurts my belly is superseding what came before. You understand? So let me put it this way. If the wages of sin is death, and the gift of God is eternal life, then the wages of sin need to be the opposite of the gift. What is the gift? Eternal life. Now we have more information about the death. What kind of death? Eternal death. So if we were going to reread the text, right? The wages of sin is eternal death, but... The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Okay, so when Jesus was crucified, he died the second death, which you might call eternal death. And I know that is incredible because like, wait a minute, he's alive. So how could he have died eternal death when he's not dead now? Well, Reality is, when Jesus died, he died the penalty for sin. Miraculously, his adopted humanity was allowed to die because God can't die. His adopted human form died and rested in the tomb over the hours of the Sabbath. And then on the Sunday, of course, Christ our Lord is risen again. Hallelujah. Just like the song writer penned, right? And so when he died, He died the penalty of sin miraculously, and then miraculously he arose in his own strength. He said, I lay down my life that I may take it again. I have this commandment of my father. So now he arose from the tomb with all power in his hands, all victory, the keys of hell, grave, and the death, and death in his hands. And he will throw all of that into the lake of fire one day. But the Bible is teaching us that when Jesus died and he died for us, he died what the penalty for sin was, which is eternal death. And miraculously, now he is alive. Why? One, because he never sinned. Thank God. So when he died for you, he died for me. He died under the penalty of sin, but it was in your place as substitute for you. Jesus never sinned. Thank God. Okay, well, we'll talk about why that's important in a moment. In a moment. Nevertheless, I live, the text continues, yet not I, but Christ. Just like the hymn writer pen, not I, but Christ. Yes. Okay. So when Jesus died, he died, Bible says, from the foundations of the world, like his mind is eternal. God, our father's mind is eternal. Therefore, the plan of salvation, even though it was not in position or in place until, and, or when I say in place, enacted until humankind sinned, the plan was firmly in place in the eternal mindset of God. Therefore, whenever Adam and Eve sinned, God was able to boop, hit the button in time so that they would not have to die what? The second death immediately. So the wages of sin is not getting hit by a truck and not living and succumbing to that reality. The wages of sin is not getting a disease, a terminal disease, and then succumbing to that. The wages of sin, although those are byproducts, the reality or the up, up, the 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 possibility for someone to die in that way comes because of sin. Yes. But those are not the actual consequence of sin because you can, as the Bible says, come back from that sleep. If you're in Christ, you come back from that sleep and then he gives it immortality at the right time. If we're not, God forbid, God forbid, not in Christ, then a person will come back up to face condemnation And then they will receive, God forbid, eternal death penalty. 
But that is not the, the, the you know, those, those kinds of things are not the wages of sin. The wages of sin is eternal death. Okay. So in God's mind is the plan of salvation. He puts it into motion at just the right time. Now we have a probationary period where we can um, say yes to God. And if we, God forbid, make mistakes along the way after we've said yes to God, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. But when Jesus was on the cross, actually, he was dying for your sin. You were born in the 50s, the 30s, the 40s, the 70s, like I was, early 70s. You were born in the, the thousand, 2000s. You were born in the 1990s, right? You were born in whatever year you were born. Some of you maybe even the 20s, right? And so while you were born just then, or your grandparents in the 1800s, right? While you were born then and were not alive whenever Jesus uh, whenever Jesus was on the cross, you were in his mind and he was dying in your place. And therefore, if you profess and live faith in Christ, the cross of Jesus Christ and all of the victory that comes as a result of that is yours. So when Christ died on Calvary's cross, when he was treated unjustly, but he took on the punishment that you and I deserve. That means that in him we were crucified. And the symbol of us actually going through this with him, the symbol of us actually moving into a relationship of faith was given to us by the same writer under the power of the Holy Ghost, Paul, when he wrote in the book of Romans that when we go down into the, what we call, watery grave, we go down in baptism, under the surface of the water, we are immersed, we are submerged. In that moment, we are participating, spiritually speaking, in the principle of his death. But this time, what we're doing is dying to sin. We are crucified with Christ. We are dying to sin when we give ourselves to him, when we are born or reborn of the water, of the spirit. Yes, when that happens, we are crucified with Christ. But something else miraculously happens. We, we die to sin. But then the Bible says, nevertheless, I what? Live. Wait a minute. So I come back from, wait a minute. What? What? Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. So as Jesus came from the tomb miraculously, as Gabriel was sent from heaven and he said, Son of man, son of God, thy father calls thee. Hmm. The Bible is teaching us that when Jesus took up his life again and Gabriel called him, he came, he was coming out of the tomb miraculously. I did not say Gabriel waked him up, woke him up. That's a whole different study. I did not say that. But when Jesus came out of that tomb victoriously, he now bequeaths us that same victory. He gives us the victory over death, victory over eternal death in our life. Victory so that when we go down into the watery grave of baptism, the Holy Spirit resurrects us. Hallelujah. He resurrects us so we will not have to be subject to those death principles, as in Romans chapter 7. Those, the law of sin and death, where we are obligated to do evil because we are not sanctified. Yes. So God gives us victory so that when the Holy Spirit is in us, teaching us everything whatsoever Jesus commanded us and enacting the principles of Jesus Christ in our actual lives. It is not I that now lives, but Christ that lives in me. So when I go down, I die to sin. When I come back up, spiritually speaking, now I am empowered. You are empowered to do what? God's will, which is why the benediction in the book of Jude, Jude is so critical when Jude says, uh, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence with exceeding joy. The reason that is so critical is because only those who are crucified with Christ, are you getting the picture now? Only those who are crucified with Christ 
can live for him. Only those who are crucified to sin, who are dying and dead to sin and being raised, spiritually speaking, can be empowered to do God's will, which is why there is no pride in salvation, which is why there is no self-sufficiency in salvation, because unless you can raise yourself from the dead, which nobody can, no normal human being can do this, unless you can do that, then you and I have to rely on Christ because now I am not the one who's living. I am living unto the Son of God. He's the one in me now who loved me and gave himself for me. Are you getting the picture now? This is a beautiful uh, passage of scripture. I'll just uh, push a pause right there because I could really give you the entire time that we're together just on that uh, passage but I'm going to move on. Christ within, that is the backdrop. Pardon me, that is our backdrop now. So Christ within, we're going to the book of John, the book of John chapter 17, and I will begin at verse 20. I'll read just two, just two verses, I think. Yes, all right. And Jesus in his, what is called his high priestly prayer, as he is rounding the corner, coming down to the end of his earthly life. Bible says here, and this is Jesus praying to his father, neither pray I for these alone. He's praying for you, even though you weren't born yet. In the mind of God, he knew you well. Hmm. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also, which shall believe on me through their word. So for those persons uh, who are clicking the link, that you sent out in this case, say tonight as an example, you clicked, a, you sent a, a share, you clicked share, you clicked watch party, you, sh you shared somehow in your WhatsApp or whatever, that th this program or something like this at another point in time, you shared your personal testimony, you were kind and affectionate to someone, right? Manifesting the character of Jesus Christ and people saw your light so shining before them. So they now learn to glorify our Father, which is in heaven. Since that is the case, now, now, Jesus will have prayed for those persons because they are the ones who believe on him through your testimony, through your ministry. And of course, the Holy Spirit is the one orchestrating all of that. But he said, I don't pray for these only. I'm not praying for these only, but for them also who shall believe on me through their word. Verse 21, that they all may be what? One, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. So Jesus is welcoming us to the, into the fellowship of, of unity with God our Father, with Jesus Christ, and of course, where Jesus is, so must the Holy Spirit be. Amen. He's welcoming us into that unity, that fellowship, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. So unity with God, unity with like-minded believers is an indicator, thank God, is an indicator of Jesus's ministry being exactly what he said it would be. It is an indication that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It is an indication that Jesus Christ was sent here to do a particular mission, and that particular mission was to save his people from their sins. And I thank God, and to manifest the glory of God our Father here. So what is the hope of glory? What is the hope of glory? I'm going to uh, read from the book of Colossians, and notice I did not say, boy, I get excited when I think about this glory, uh, I didn't say uh, who is the king of glory. <laughs> Boy, the Lord God Almighty Christ is that king of glory. But we won't get into that tonight because, boy, uh, I'll just get a little bit too excited. Verse 27 of the book of Colossians chapter 1, and the Bible reads, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, the Old Testament writer talked about Israel, and it was a, it was a symbol of Jesus in this case, uh, being 
being a, a message, basically, to the Gentiles. Jesus was to be that, and of course, others participated or partook in that ministry. But here, it says here that he wants to make known the riches of the glory of his mystery among the Gentiles, which is what? Christ in you. Christ in you, not just the Colossian people, the people in Colossae, no. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. So whenever people see your life, they hopefully will be able to glorify God, our Father, because of the light that they see emanating, ooh, exuding from, hmm, coming from, radiating from your life. And now we understand that is the hope of glory, Christ in me. One day, one day, as Jesus said in John 17, please put me back in my position, Father, where I share glory with you. He also said, make us one with him, even as Jesus and the Father are one. So that means that one day we will share in his glory, in the fullness, though. We're talking about the fullness, not just reflect it on earth like Moses did when he went into the mountain, then into the cloud. The Bible says that he was so bright and dazzling and beautiful and effulgent that when he came down off that mount, the people, in Paul's writing, who were in unbelief, said, please, put a veil over your face. Cover it up, Moses. It's too bright. We can't handle the truth. Cover up that, that brightness, Moses, but that brightness came because he was in the presence of God, our Father. Hallelujah. He was in the presence of God. And therefore, when he came out of the presence, and maybe we should just say the presence, when he came out of the presence, it was evident that he had been there in the presence of God. Amen and amen. So hopefully we will partake in that by God's grace. If God bless us. We're faithful. And he keeps that which we have committed until that day, then we will also have that glory. I'm looking forward to that. Bible teaches us basically a principle that we can reflect the brightness of God through uh, Jesus Christ. Bible talks about the sunlight that governs the day, the sun that governs the day. Well, there are planets in is a there is a planet in our solar system called Saturn. Saturn, and it has rings, and it's an incredible uh, chemistry lesson. But what we learn from astronomy is that in, at, in, in Saturn, you have all of these rings that reflect the rays of the sunlight. But beyond that, those rings actually begin to radiate their own light. The Bible says that we are to be as lights in this world during this wicked and perverse generation. Bible says, let your light so shine before people that when people see your good works, they will glorify your father. And so not like just the moon that reflects the light of the sun, but we have such a connection with God that his power begins to emanate from us, generate from us if we are faithful to him. Very interesting concept. We're going to the book of 2 Corinthians and hopefully you are following along, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And I will begin reading at verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and I will read beginning at verse 10. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in your body. So if you died to sin, then the life of Christ is manifest in your lifestyle, what you do, what you think what your intents are, those secret parts of you, how your countenance is revealed to people, right? Your actions toward people, your relationship with the people of God, your relationship with the people who don't know God. All of this is a manifestation, if we are in Christ, of the fact that we are dying, we have died to sin. Verse 11, for we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. There will be trials. There will be tribulations. Jesus said uh, that those who live godly in Christ Jesus, through his word, he said, and they shall suffer persecution. Jesus said in uh, the Sermon on the Mount that when people do all manner of evil against you and talk all kind of foolishness and lies against you for his sake, he said, rejoice and be exceeding glad 
when they persecute you in this way, for my sake. For great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So you are in good company. You would be compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. And those stalwarts who lived and died for Christ are going to be raised and going to be rewarded. And you will partake in the same kind of reward if you're faithful. Thank God. And then so it says here that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest, not just in you generically, but it says here in your or our mortal flesh. Pardon me. In our mortal flesh. So the Bible is promising us through the Holy Spirit. pardon me, promising us through the Holy Spirit that in this life, in this present world, as spoken in another place in Scripture, we can live victoriously and Jesus Christ's life will be revealed in us. Okay, so I'm going to read now under the caption, Divinity Revealed in Humanity. So we talked a little bit about Christ within. We talked about dying to sin, being raised to Christ kind of life, Christ-like living. Divinity Revealed in Humanity, Galatians chapter 1. That's the book of Galatians chapter 1, and I will read verses 15 and 16. Galatians chapter 1, and I will read verses 15 and 16. 16. And the Bible reads, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. So Paul is being called, meaning he has been welcomed into relationship with God and given his marching orders to do whatever ministry is called to do. That happens to everyone who becomes a child of God. We're called. And if we uh, continue the faith, we will have uh, been seen as those who are also chosen, called and chosen, okay? So from his mother, he's, uh, God separated me from my mother's womb. He had a plan for me, like the Bible says that God had a plan for Jeremiah and for you. He called me by his grace to reveal his son in me. His job, Paul's job at his own admission, his ministry at his own admission, his own, uh, uh, his purpose, the privilege was all his, right? As with you, to reveal his son, meaning God's son in his own life, Paul's life, your life, my life, that I might preach him among the heathen. In Paul's case, his marching orders were to go into the Gentiles. Immediately, I conferred not with flesh and blood. It's a long history uh, about Paul's ministry and uh, his 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 former uh, um, connection to the Pharisees and and all of that and how he had to turn his back on that and uh, count it all dung uh, so he could have the glory of God revealed in him right for the excellency of Jesus Christ as Lord to be in him yes and so he's talking about all of that and he's saying I didn't go to people. To validate the experience I had on the road to Damascus. I didn't go to people to see because they led me astray before, frankly. When Stephen was being stoned, Paul was led astray, even though the Holy Ghost was working so that Paul could really be changed. Of course, Paul was resistant. And uh, inspiration says that Paul consulted with some folks that were in leadership. And they were like, oh, don't worry about that. The whole Jesus thing, that's nothing. It's a farce. It's a farce. We've already told you, and you agree. It's a farce. And Paul is saying, no, I'm not conferring with people in this case. Like, I'm done with that. I know in whom I believe. I know the one who has called me. I know the one whom I encountered on the road to Damascus. I know the one who is working in my life right now. And therefore, I am here to reveal him to the world inasmuch as God is giving me the strength. Thank God. All right. And so the question is now, what promise is made to those in whom Christ lives, right? What promise is made to those 
whom God is revealing himself through. Okay, so we're going to read from the book of Romans, the book of Romans chapter 8, and just a couple, a few verses. Romans chapter 8, just a few verses. I'll begin reading at verse 10. Romans chapter 8, I'll read verses 10, 12, and 13. 10, 12, and 13. And if Christ be in you, the Bible says, the body is dead because of sin. That means that we are not allowing our bodies anymore because we're surrendering to God. We're not allowing our bodies anymore to do the works of evil and unrighteousness anymore, right? So the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit, mm, the Holy Spirit here, is life because of righteousness. So the Holy Spirit is working in the life of those who are being made righteous. Verse 12, therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh, because the preceding chapter, chapter 7, shows that those identified there who need to be rescued from this body of death are subjects of the devil, subjected to every whim of the enemy who cannot do good, who cannot please God, who cannot do any good thing at all, has no victory. Well, those persons are now being transformed if they have surrendered to God by who? The indwelling Holy Spirit, so that they are no longer indebted to do evil, but now, because God has been good to them, God has been good to you, now we're indebted to God to live according to the Holy Spirit's promptings. We become the, the servants of the living God. We become his subjects. We, come, we become a manifestation of his power, his glory, his brightness. We become witnesses, if you have to use one word, witnesses of God. Very nice. And of course, Paul continues, Paul continues, uh, verse 13, for if I live after the flesh or according to the flesh, or if ye live according to the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Holy Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, that is, allow those deeds to die, the wicked deeds of, of doing uh, according to the lifestyle of a person who has not surrendered to God. If you mortify the deeds of the body, you will live. Are you getting that? Are you getting that? If you mortify the deeds of the body, you will live. So surrender to God. Let him crucify you in the power of the Holy Spirit. Let him kill the sinful tendencies toward evil, inherit it. Hmm, cultivated tendencies toward evil can be supplanted in our lives and subjected to God's will and thereby killed dead. I know that's redundant, but I just needed to say it that way. And of course, faith is more than just a passive state of mind. This is the way we access that kind of power, a mere acknowledgement of belief. It's not an assent to say, yes, God is powerful. Yes, he's good. Yes, if we surrender our will to him, we will be saved. That's great intellectually. That's great a profession, right? But we need to actually be transformed by that. It's not just an acknowledgement. It is an active principle that engages the power of the will. Now we need to exert our will. This kind of faith pushes us, propels us, uh, 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 causes us to yield ourselves to God. Yes, to use our will in that way. It means such an, a harmony with the indwelling Christ that sin loses its power, hallelujah, in the life and our desires, our thinking, and our conduct become conformable to his will. We conform to Christ in that case. Let me move forward. I hope you're getting this. It's a blessing. I'm going to move forward now to the book of Galatians chapter uh, four, Galatians chapter four, to further illustrate, and then we'll move on. Chapter four, verse 19, Galatians chapter four, verse 19, my little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. So Paul is saying that Christ will be formed in you, and it was his express purpose and uh, way that he exerted his will 
to help people to come into a knowledge and relationship with Jesus Christ. And he said, yo, he, he will be formed in you. He will be the hope of glory in you. He will. He will. And I'm so thankful that that is the reality. Now, we're going to move to our next caption or subheading, by faith through operation of the Spirit. And we've already talked about it from Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. So we're not going to go back over that. But that is the principle, all that I said introducing uh, tonight's lesson study and more. But we're going to take up that thought a little bit further in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 3, that's the book of Ephesians chapter 3, and I will read uh, verses 16 and 17. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. And the Bible reads that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his son in the inner man. So even that deep place in your consciousness and your conscience that should be educated by the Holy Spirit. But even in that deep place, people used to call it the recesses, the deep recesses of your mind, that place when Jesus is knocking, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anybody lets me in, I will come into him and I will sup with him and he with me. When you let God into your life, as Jesus is knocking, when he comes in, he's not just coming into the living room. He's not just coming into that, that place, the formal place where you let company or guests come. No, he's going in the closet. He's going under the bed. He's going into the cupboards. He's going into the back part of your refrigerator, up under the sink where you keep that good liquor. Oops, not good liquor. That's what you used to think when you walked according to your former lusts. Yeah, not into the liquor cabinet. No, he's taking those out of your taste buds so that you don't live according to that anymore into that cell phone where you used to watch pornography, mm. into those interactions with those so-called friends where you used to smoke weed together. And every time we saw you, your hands were going like this. And those of us in Jamaica land we love know what that is. Getting that weed prepared for the spliff to smoke, not anymore. Jesus is now welcomed into all of those deep and secret places, the deep part of the mind that doesn't even manifest itself physically Nobody gets to see it, but Jesus sees it. He goes in there, deep into those places, and now he replaces all of that wickedness if we are, are dead to sin. And he begins to live his life within us through the Holy Spirit, to be strengthened with the might of his spirit in the inner man. Verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded and love may be able to uh, comprehend something with all saints. What is the breadth? What is the length? What is the depth? What is the height? Hallelujah. And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. What a blessing. God has been faithful to you. And he wants to live that faithfulness through you so others can also experience his faithfulness. Amen. I'm going to read uh, from the book of uh, Desire of Ages, page 428, 428. And this uh, gives us further understanding. It is faith that connects us with heaven and brings us strength for coping with the powers of darkness. Thank God. In Christ... God has provided means for subduing every sinful trait. Did you get that? Every sinful trait and resisting every temptation, however strong. Am I thankful? Yes, I am thankful. Are you thankful? Are you thankful? And so uh, Ellen White is in agreement with Paul, who said that there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will with the temptation provide a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. That is our privilege when we are uh, living by faith through the operation of the Holy Spirit. 
Now, the book of John, the book of John, we are coming down to a close. We have under or fewer than 10 minutes left. The book of John, uh, chapter 17 and verse 23, will provide some more guidance and comfort as we read a little bit more from Jesus's prayer. If a man, I meant 17, I didn't mean to say seven. I'm talking about the prayer of Jesus Christ. John chapter 17, verse 23. I in them, this is the glory that God wants to have. Jesus wants us to share with God, share with him. And the glory which, uh, um, I'll start with 22. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them. So he's sharing this glory. That they may be one even as we are one, okay, I in them and thou in me, that they may be perfect, that is complete, fully developed spiritually, in me, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me. We read this, but we're reading it now with fresh eyes. And hast loved them as thou loved me. So it becomes a manifestation to the world that Jesus's ministry was valid and that his ministry was effective because there are persons who live according to the power of said ministry in the Holy Spirit. Thank God. All right. Now, John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17. I love the book of John because he has a firm grasp of these principles, had a firm grasp of these principles, but he said it more simply than Paul would have said it. Okay, so verse 16 of John chapter 14, the Bible reads, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. I won't go into the Greek thing about what that means. But this means God's Holy Spirit in the same, in the same, um, 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 in the same uh, teaching, in the same power, in the same intent as Jesus Christ, Jesus' other self. Someone like Jesus who will carry the message of Christ with him because Jesus will be uh, uh, positioned in the life of those who receive the Spirit. So all that he commanded, all that he taught comes now through the Holy Ghost. Yes. And the Bible continues that he may abide with you forever. We want the Holy Spirit abiding with you forever. Verse 17, even the spirit of truth, truth about you, the truth about God. Truth about God is he's holy and just and good. Truth about me is that I'm sold under sin and I need a savior. And when all of that comes together, if through the spirit I submit to God, then the truth is that God is now beginning to live in me through Christ and the Holy Ghost. And now, now I can please him. You can please him. Even through the Holy Spirit, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Meaning he will come through the Holy Spirit to all when he says, I will be with you always. It is through the agency of the divine Holy Spirit. Thank God. And so now we can see that the Holy Spirit is critical, critical. And I'll uh, give a little bit further view on that from the book Desire of Ages, page 388. And we're running we're running page 388 it is through the holy spirit it is through the holy spirit that christ dwells in us and the spirit of god received into the heart by faith is the beginning of the life eternal yes so as soon as we accept fully right we accept jesus christ into our lives we receive eternal life and then we are being uh, conformed to his will. We are being transformed by the renewing of our mind. And then we're looking forward to the day when Jesus returns, that we will receive immortality. That is the inability to ever die again. New bodies, new bodies. Thank God. Okay. So our last caption, final caption, assurance in victory. How many of you need assurance that God can be victorious through you? I've already recited to you from uh, Jude's benediction that Jesus is able to keep us from falling. 
he is able to present us faultless before the Father with exceeding joy. Now I'm going to read from the book of 1 John. 1 John, as I said, John had an incredible grasp on these principles, uh, but he had more simple language than Paul did on some of these same things. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4, Ye are of God, little children, meaning those who surrender to him, and have overcome them, that is, the wickedness of the world, right? The lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Overcome uh, those who are in place, putting themselves in place of Christ uh, in the world, right? He's saying here that you have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Thank God. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. Do you believe that those who are with you are more than those who are with the worldly ends and the devil? Yes, I hope so. Do you believe that God has dispatched angels who excel in strength to stand guard over you, hmm? to keep you in all your ways, lest at any time you dash your foot against a stone? God would just as soon empty all of heaven of the retinue of angels to come to your aid than to allow just one of you, one of us, to stumble. God loves you. He is committed to you. He is ready to save all of us, and he's ready to stamp his life approval on us so that we represent him to the world. Well, what is Christ called? What is Christ called? I'm going to read from the book of Psalm, and you would be wondering, why would I go back to the book of Psalm? Uh, chapter 20, the book of Psalm, chapter 20, and I will read verse 5. We will rejoice in thy salvation, and in the name of our God, we will set up our banners, the Lord fulfill all my petitions. We rejoice in thy salvation. Did you know that Jesus is actually called redemption, salvation, redemption, salvation, redemption, very similar words. Redemption means to purchase, of course. Purchase what? Salvation for those who are lost, right? Jesus is called our redemption in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 30 and 31. Jesus is called our redemption. And here, uh, uh, the margin reads for the book of Psalm chapter 20 and verse 5, we will triumph in the, quote, victory. Christ met the enemy upon every point where we must meet him and won the victory. This victory was not for himself, but for us. When we open our heart and Jesus comes in, he brings us to the victory, which he himself won over all the powers of darkness. So now we can rejoice in our salvation Hmm? And in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. The Lord fulfill all thy petitions. Amen. Amen again. I'll read verse six. Now know I that the Lord saveth his anointed. He will hear from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. And in another place, it says that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. The name of Jesus. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so we can see here we, why we must rejoice in his name. Because in his name is power. And his name is victory. And his name is the manifestation of what God our Father wants to do to us. And of course, we are blessed to know that Christ is going to abide in the life of those who are willing to run with him and to live with him. And in the book of Colossians chapter 2, we only have a couple of seconds left. The time has run away. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. So I give thanks that God has given us his victory, and we just need to receive it every day, every moment of the day by faith. Victory through the indwelling Christ. 
Father, thank you for the privilege of receiving your spirit. Please give us more power. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen again. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your Sabbath. We are out of time. We just made it. Peace and love. <music>